there is one week in all of human history that stands above all others in terms of the impact it has on all of us. I'm, of course, talking about the final week of Christ's mortality, the week of the atonement and crucifixion. I find it much easier to follow and remember the events if I can think about them in their context and order. So this video is designed to take us through the final week, including what happened and where these events occurred. Let's begin with the Sunday prior to the resurrection. On this day, Christ was in Bethany, a small village about three miles east of Jerusalem, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. On their way to Jerusalem, they walked through Bethphage, where he dispatched some disciples to obtain a donkey so he could be seated on the donkey as he entered Jerusalem for what we know as the triumphal entry. From Matthew 21, we know that, quote, a very great multitude came out and spread their garments and palm leaves and was praising his name. Tragically, most Jews believed that what Christ will do at his second coming is what they expected at this time. Jacob refers to this as the Jews, quote, looking beyond the mark. Jealous and embittered Pharisees exclaimed, quote, the world is gone after him. As Christ came towards Jerusalem, he wept over the city as he contemplated the future destruction that would come upon its inhabitants. He prayed, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. John 12 states that there was a reply from heaven and that an angel spoke to him. It was on this day that the Savior gave the discourse on the children of light, reminding the people that the light would be with them only yet a little while, and admonishing them, quote, while ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of the light. On Monday, the Savior returned again to Jerusalem from Bethany. This is the day he cursed the fig tree. Now we could do a whole video just on that topic, as well as any and all of these topics that we're going to discuss here today. There is a debate among scholars regarding the cleansing of the temple. Some place this incident on Sunday due to Matthew 21.12 and Luke 19.45, while others believe it happened on Monday because of what is said in Mark 11, verse 11, and Mark 15. This was three years to the week when the Savior first cleansed the temple. However, in the first account, he referred to it as his father's house, while this time he referred to it as my house. By the end of this week, he will refer to it as your house. Significant meaning to be sure. The events of Tuesday and Wednesday are not clear in Scripture, exactly which events happened on which days, so we will discuss all of these events as combined. During these days is when the now threatened Jewish hierarchy feels they must discredit the Savior before he takes over leadership. When the Savior arrives on the Temple Mount, the first group is from the hierarchy of the Temple, and they ask him by what authority he does these things and who gave him this authority. Rather than answering, Christ asks them a question of where John the Baptist got his authority. Rather than answering honestly, they only thought about how the crowd would react. They knew if they said John's power was from heaven, the crowd would ask them why they didn't believe in him. But if they said that it was from men, they would revolt because the crowd considered John a prophet. So they didn't answer, and neither did Christ answer them. He then gave three parables to those present. The first was the parable of the two sons, and then the parable of the wicked husbandman, and lastly, the parable of the royal marriage feast. A great deal of learning can come from studying these parables in the context of where Christ was at the time and who was present when he gave these. A second group of ridiculers were the Herodians, which were those who supported the rulership of Herod and the Romans as the hostile occupying force in Judea, and their goal was to bring down any new religious leadership. Their question to Christ in an attempt to snare him was if it were lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not. But Jesus saw right through their plan, and in his famous words he said, quote, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. A third group attempting to trick the Savior were the Sadducees. If you remember, the Sadducees were opposed to the Pharisees regarding several points of religion, perhaps the most important regarding the resurrection, which they did not believe in. That is how I always remember them, by the way. 
They don't believe in the resurrection, so they are sad, you see. Anyway, they asked a hypothetical question about who a woman would be with in the afterlife after being married to seven consecutive brothers in this life. Christ answered both the temporal question as well as the real question about the resurrection. We could do hours and hours of lessons on any one of these topics, but again, this video is meant to be a contextualized view of the events of Christ's final week, so forgive the brevity of these stories. The final group to attempt to ensnare Christ was the Pharisees. They asked, which is the first commandment of all? To this the Lord gave his famous answer, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. No one asked any more questions after this. Christ then taught his disciples while all those around could hear about the false teachings of the Pharisees, often calling them hypocrites, serpents, and a generation of vipers. Then the Savior lamented over Jerusalem again and pronounced the destruction of Jerusalem and that, quote, there shall not be left here one stone upon another, which was fulfilled in 70 AD. The Savior then went to the Mount of Olives, where his disciples asked him privately to explain his prophecies. His answers are in-depth and encompass more than just the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, but also his second coming and the end of the world. These teachings are across several chapters, including Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and also Joseph Smith Matthew. Then Christ gave three parables all related to this subject, including the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. While we can't be certain, evidence suggests that it was on Thursday that Judas Iscariot plotted with the chief priests and the Pharisees. A lot happened between Thursday and Sunday, as you all know. Thursday evening is when the Last Supper happens in a, quote, large upper room. This is where the Lord institutes the sacrament. He washes the feet of the apostles and asks them to continue this ordinance. It was on this occasion that the Lord commanded them to love one another as I have loved you. This is also when Christ tells Peter, quote, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He also promised his apostles that he would not leave them comfortless and that he would send the other comforter, with the astounding promise that the Holy Ghost shall bring all things unto your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Perhaps the greatest teachings in all of Scripture happen in the next several chapters, John chapter 14 through 17, and it's all one sermon that Christ gives to his apostles as they walk from the upper room to Gethsemane. To do this next part of the video, we need to acquaint ourselves with the city of Jerusalem, as it was at the time of Christ. Here is the Temple Mount. The Mount of Olives is labeled as B. The Pool of Siloam, where Christ healed the blind man, is here. This is the city of David. The lower city here is where the poor section of the city was. The wealthier upper city was here, which is actually where the Last Supper likely took place. In fact, tradition tells us it was probably right about here. The Lord gives this amazing sermon in John 14 through 17 as they walk to Gethsemane, which is clear on the other side of the city, outside of the city walls at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. While we are not told the route they took, based on geography of the city, location of gates, and perhaps attempting to avoid attention, this could be the route he took to the Garden of Gethsemane. Here at the Garden of Gethsemane is where Christ claims the title of Savior as he takes upon himself the sins of the world on condition of our repentance. This combined with the crucifixion and resurrection make up the atonement, which is the greatest event to ever occur in the history of the world. It is likely that Christ's suffering extended for several hours past midnight into Friday. Upon leaving the Garden of Gethsemane, the Savior met Judas, the chief priests and captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to take him to trial. Then, with a rope around his neck, he was taken to an illegal trial in the middle of the night, first to Ananias' palace and then to Caiaphas's, according to John's account, where there was a subset of especially corrupt high priests and members of the Sanhedrin. Again, we don't know for sure, but it is believed that Ananias' palace was here in the wealthy part of the city, as well as Caiaphas's, which is believed to be here. 
it seems likely that he would have been taken through the temple grounds and through the wealthier part of the city to avoid the poor areas where Christ had many more followers. When he got to Ananias' palace, he was charged with sedition, meaning a disturber of the peace, and blasphemy, meaning falsely assuming the authority of God, which was the most serious charge in the Jewish law. In Matthew 26, 63, he was asked directly, Tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. According to Mark 14, 62, his answer was clear and definite, I am. The apostate high priest cried out, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? He is guilty of death. Then they spat on him and smote him with the palms of their hands. It is during this trial that Peter denies Christ three times. However, the power to pronounce capital punishment had been taken away from the Jewish council by Roman decree. Thus, the leaders of the Sanhedrin had him delivered to Pilate, so an official decree of death could be issued. So he was taken to Pilate at the judgment hall, which is here. Pilate was the governor of Judea who lived in Caesarea, but happened to be in Jerusalem for the Jewish feasts. The charges against Jesus were now changed to that of high treason, the most serious offense in the Roman law. They also accused him of making himself a king. When Pilate asked the Savior directly, Are thou the king of the Jews? The Savior answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Finding no fault in him, he was about to let him go free when one of the priests claimed that Jesus had been teaching treason, beginning from Galilee to this place. Pilate used this opportunity to have Jesus sent to Herod, the vassal ruler of the province of Galilee, who was also in Jerusalem for the Passover season. So Christ was taken to Herod's palace, which is here. However, when the Savior refused to answer any of the questions put to him by Herod, he was again taken before Pilate by the members of the Sanhedrin who were determined to have a death sentence pronounced against him. Pilate still insisted on releasing Jesus and reminded the Jews that it was customary to release one prisoner during the festivities. However, the crowd cried, Release Barabbas! Thus, he who was rightfully guilty of sedition and murder was released. So Pilate asked what he would have them do with Christ, and they said, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate's reply was that he found no fault in the man and he washed his hands of his blood. And then came the cry that doomed many generations of Jews, his blood be on us and our children. Even then, Pilate was about to let the Savior go with just a scourging and a chastisement when a person cried out, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Apparently this pushed Pilate over the edge. Caesar had given Pilate his power, and he didn't want to lose favor. Thus, Pilate agreed to the crucifixion and turned Jesus over to the soldiers to be scourged. And scourged he was with forty stripes, save one, with a leather-thronged whip with pieces of glass and metal woven into it. A crown of thorns was placed on his head, and a cross was placed on his back, and he was expected to carry it to Golgotha to be crucified. That journey isn't a long one, but for someone that had gone through what Christ had over the previous 24 hours, it was more than he could do on his own. He fell, and a man named Simon assisted him in carrying the cross. Pilate ordered the words inscribed above Christ to read, quote, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And despite the Jewish leaders attempting to get him to change the inscription, Pilate said, quote, What I have written, I have written. And there at Golgotha he was crucified. According to Bruce R. McConkie, he was nailed to the cross beginning at about 9 a.m. on Friday. At about noon there was a great earthquake, and the heavens drew black, and there was darkness over all the earth for many hours. The earthquake was so great that it rent the veil of the temple. It was about three in the afternoon when the Savior cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he said, It is finished, and Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
According to Jewish law, a body should not be unburied on the Sabbath. And so as sundown approached, his followers took his body from the cross and incompletely prepared it for burial. One of his followers, Joseph of Arimathea, gave his tomb for the burial, thus ending the darkest yet most amazing day in the history of the world. Not much is said about the seventh day in the Gospels. The most verbose account is from Luke 23, which says, Rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. While we know the Lord was very busy in the world of spirits that day, the tomb lay very quiet. It was yet dark early Sunday morning when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb with spices to anoint Christ's body. However, the tomb was empty. Matthew 28 describes another earthquake when the angel descends and rolls away the stone from the entrance of the sepulcher. Those guarding the tomb fall to the ground as if dead. And when the Marys approach, he tells them that Christ is not there, that he is risen. They are instructed to tell the apostles. Mark 16 states that when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. She gave this occurrence to Peter and the other apostles, but they did not believe her until he appeared to them later. A challenge I would give you if you are interested is to study all of the scriptures related to the events that happened during the last few hours of Christ's mortal life. Study from the Last Supper through the Resurrection. This study will lead to a much deeper knowledge and appreciation of the Savior, the Atonement, and the plan of salvation. Thanks for watching.